Issa Ibrahim is a graduate of NYC's High School of Art and Design and studied at the School of Visual Arts and the Art Students League. In the 1990s, after enduring the trauma of American racism, marijuana addiction, losing his mind, and a devastating family tragedy, Issa Ibrahim found himself institutionalized indefinitely in an asylum. His current project is his entry to the Conquering Disabilities Festival with his documentary film, Mad Love. With us today, we have Issa Ibrahim. Hi, Issa, and welcome to the show. Hello, Sheila. Welcome again. This is my second time on your show, so I'm very excited to be here again with you. Well, we're very glad to have you back again. So please, for the people who didn't catch you last time, introduce yourself and tell us how you came to be involved with the Creedmoor Psychiatric Institute. Well, hello all. My name is Issa, and I'm an artist, an author, a musician, a filmmaker, and an activist. In the late 80s, early 90s, I suffered a traumatic psychotic break. And, and as a result of that, there was a horrible family tragedy that ensued, which led me into the criminal justice system, which then, by sheer luck, thank God, led me into the psychiatric system. And I say that only because going to the criminal justice system would have been even more horrific than what I experienced in the psychiatric system. But in that psychiatric system, I was sent for 20 years to Creedmoor Psychiatric Center. Chronicled very extensively, I spoke last time on your program in my book, The Hospital Always Wins. And it was a mixed blessing in that I spent 20 years in a madhouse, and trust me, it was a madhouse, but I had a, a, an art program, a rehabilitation program that changed my life and informed my life. So I, it was a mixed blessing. Now, we all have a story. And in the case of mentally ill, that means revealing the diagnosis. How were you diagnosed at Creedmoor and why? It's interesting. At Creedmoor, I was given about three or four different diagnoses over the years. And I discovered that it was because every time I got a new doctor, because when you're there for a period of time, it's inevitable another doctor will come on to your case and your, your other doctor will leave you. He was an intern or whatever. And every time I got a new doctor, I was given a different diagnosis. Maybe because they feel like they have to come on and feel like they're curing the demon or there's some hubris involved. I'm not, I'm not sure. But my first diagnosis was drug-induced psychosis. And then after that, another doctor came on, gave me schizophreniform disorder. Then another doctor came on, gave me schizoaffective disorder. And finally, after a while, it was settled on schizophrenia, uh, paranoid schizophrenia, chronic type. But even that was amended after a while when another doctor came on uh, and it, the, the chronic type was amended because it seemed to be in remission thanks to the medication that I was on. But I've settled on schizophrenia and I'm, I, I guess I, I could be happy with that. Although I'll be honest, when, when I went in for a tune-up two or three years ago, I was re-hospitalized briefly. My medication needed to be readjusted. And another doctor came on and tried to give me a borderline, or not, uh, what was it, uh, bipolar disorder. And, and I was told that they're trying to eradicate the schizophrenia diagnosis so that sometime by the mid or late 21st century, there'll be no more schizophrenia. So that's why most people who were once schizophrenic are now being diagnosed with bipolar. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, it, it changes with the weather almost, it seems like. But that's... That was my diagnosis. So I'll settle with schizophrenia for now. That's my diagnosis. You have won several long-standing battles in your life for love and freedom. How did you win your way free from Creedmoor Psychiatric Institute? I'll be honest. I was very fortunate in that I had a talent and I, I could paint and paint well and paint well enough even further so that people seeing my paintings would want them and buy them. I'm not patting myself on the back, but that was just a reality. And as a result, I sold a lot of my paintings through the back door of Creedmoor and saved all the money to the point where when I finally decided, you know, I suffered enough and, and could stop punishing myself for what I'd done and why I was there for so long and misbehaving for a while, which I was doing. I had enough money to hire a legal team and, and a couple of doctors to counter the, the Creedmoor doctor's determinations. I, I sued my way out. And I was fortunate to get before an honest judge 
who uh, heard my case and said, you know, this guy doesn't need to be there anymore. Regardless of what he did and what I might have transpired while he was there, he's done his time and he seems healthy, so let's let him go. And that's how I got out. It was a hard, it was a hard fought legal battle. And I, I tell other people in, in hospitals, I've done outreach to various other hospitals, not everyone may be fortunate enough to sell their paintings or have a talent that people would want for their homes to then pay money for. But whatever you do, save your money, save your money, because you never know when you'll need a thousand dollars, because that's basically all it will cost two or three thousand dollars to hire a lawyer and a legal team, uh, even in a rudimentary sense. So that's how I got out. I'm very fortunate to have gotten out that way. Your other major win has been in love with Susan Spangenberg. Yes. What is the Susan Spangenberg story? Susan is a, is a wonderful, wonderful person in my life and a wonderful person just in general. Uh, I met her in 1995. She ended up in a state hospital, which shouldn't happen really to anyone unless you're really terribly sick. And she wasn't really terribly sick, but it was just she went from the psych ER to a psych hospital, a state hospital which was a misstep in, in justice. But she ended up there and we met. And uh, she only spent like two or three months there. She, she was deemed well and let go, but she kept coming back. She, you know, she stayed in my life. She kept coming back to visit. And we developed a, a strong friendship and then uh, we fell in love and we've been in love and had a strong friendship for the last 26 years. As, as artists, we live together in an apartment in, in Queens, and she's just the love of my life, and she, she just enriches my life, and she's made it all worthwhile, this whole experience. Some would, some would look reflect on being in the system for so long and still being attached, as I am, to the system and look at it with bitterness, but she's made it just, she's been the sunshine in my life. I really owe a lot of my success to her. What did you publish and create during your time at Creedmoor? I was fortunate to have been writing all the time that I was there. The 20 years that I was there, I kept a journal. But as I was writing it, it wasn't like, oh, today this happened or that happened. I was writing this journal like a novel, you know, uh, with lofty ambitions, perhaps. But it made it easy to then transition that when I got out to my published novel, my published memoir, The Hospital Always Wins, which was published by Chicago Review Press in 2016. So that was a tremendous achievement for me to see all those stacks of, of notebooks and, and so forth turn into a novel. I also have a, a pretty impressive body of work that I've, I've been painting all the time that I was in, 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 in Greenmore. So I have a body of work that has ended up in certain people's collections I've sold over the years. And I have a, a, a pretty extensive catalog of songs that I recorded while in the hospital under their noses. You know, at three o'clock in the morning, I go into my, I go into a bathroom or a closet somewhere and record a bunch of songs. And, and, and now I've got like 15 CDs out that no one's buying, but uh, <laughs> they, are, they are a chronicle to my time in Creedmoor. And they all have songs of loss and, and ambiguity and, they're all centered on mental health themes, pop music around mental health themes. What accolades have you earned? Uh, you know, I, the, the, the accolades I've earned have been things that have been incremental that helped me just go further along every step of the way, a little breadcrumbs that allowed me to continue on. I was recently nominated for Best Director and Best uh, Documentary at the uh, Green uh, Disabilities Through Film Film Festival. Before that, my previous film, Patients' Rights, won Director of Merit Award. So every couple, of, and then the book came out and it was on Oprah's list for best books of the summer. So it seems like every couple of years, there's something that just pats me on the back or remind, taps me on the shoulder and reminds me, you're doing well, you're doing okay, keep going. Try, now try this, try this, you yeah. know. From starting from way back in 1996, when I was an inpatient in the hospital in Creedmoor, and I got a grant for like $15,000 to mount a show in the community, an individual artist grant. 
everyone who heard about it, when they did hear about it, were blowing their top. How, how could you do this under our nose? How could you do this? What are you going to do with all that money? Blah, blah, blah. So every, every step of the way, there's been something to push me on further. I think it's my mom kind of like blessing me from heaven and God, if you believe in God, or just a spiritual force that, that I pray to that has, has answered my prayers. So I feel fortunate. How were you involved with the Conquering Disabilities Festival this year? Susan, we, we made this film last year, Mad Love. And then Susan just said, send it, any, send it everywhere. Everywhere that says mental health. <laughs> you know, everywhere that says mental health, just send it out. We've got to get it somewhere. It's, some, it's, bound, to, it's bound to land somewhere. And one of the first, pe- first organizations that reached out to us wanting to, to screen it was the Conquering Disabilities Through Film Festival. And it was held in Las Vegas, and they even extended an invitation for us to come out and be there. But COVID kind of prevented that. You know, I, I was a little skittish about going, leaving New York and going to Las Vegas. And, and Susan was, was definitely fr- frightened of the whole COVID thing. So we decided not to attend the festival. But it did garner those two nominations for Best Director and Best, best uh, Documentary. So they've been a great organization to help us out. And we've also, we're also screening at the uh, Real Recovery Film Festival in November. So things are turning out well. Could we listen to some audio from the documentary? Yes. This is from Mad Love on CKUT. You should be more afraid of the people that are undiagnosed because they're not controlled and medicated. They're the, they're the people walking around society that say, there's nothing wrong with me. And the person who walks around and says there's nothing wrong with me is the scariest person in the world. I had a lot of doubts in 1989, 1990. I had nothing but doubts. Nothing. I had no doubt what was going on. I had no idea what the hell was going on. I had no idea what the hell was going on. My grandmother was like, take her to the psychiatrist. And my parents were like, are you crazy? You know, there's nothing wrong with her. She, my mom would just be like, she just needs a good slap in the face or something. This could probably be the, the wrap up to this whole thing. That second piece was meeting Susan. And that's really all it was about. If our listeners wish to see Mad Love, where should they go? It will be viewed. It can be viewed on November, on November fifth to the eleventh at the Real Recovery Film Festival for free. It's totally free, totally gratis. Just sign in, and the the website is Film Festival Flicks F L I X Film Festival Flicks dot com. You can view it for free, and it's a great organization. They deal with mental health, they deal with recovery, substance abuse. They're a fantastic organization. And they've given us a lot of love over the years. So come check it out there. Well, thank you for your interview today. Thank you, Sheila. You're, you're a wonderful champion. God bless you. God bless you. You've been listening to Issa Ibrahim speaking about himself, his woman, and their new documentary film, Mad Love, which they entered at the Conquering Disabilities Festival this year. I am your host, Sheila Ferrando.